In this podcast, chat about the win against Huddersfield and look ahead to Coventry. This is the Borough Breakdown podcast in this as I bore a match day chatter in a pod. One support. Curtis Fleming is there on the edge of the air. Fleming for That's Craig it. Hignett. Hit it, Higgy. Higgy hits the track. Oh! Avanelli coming alive again. Janino wants the ball played to him. Avanelli spots out. Hello and welcome to the Borough Breakdown podcast with Johnny, Dana and the most unluckiest away fan in football, Matt Rowney. <laughs> Here we are on the Borough, uh, po- the Borough podcast that gives you all the Borough Master Chat in a podcast. And Borough uh, after three points off the playoffs once again. I keep, feel like I keep saying that every single uh, pod with a win uh, last night against Huddersfield and we also lost against Rotherham. But I'm not going to mention it in this podcast because I forgot that game existed uh but guys key takeouts uh from the week um matt i'll come to you first what's what's your key take out from the week um i can't believe you got that in as early as you did but fair play <laughs> i didn't expect it um uh well key take was we are a very weird team i don't want to mention rotherham but because i was there and i'm not going to go there but um i just find it incredibly crazy that we can play rather well against a Rotherham side and lose and then go against, go to Huddersfield a few days later, play quite a bit worse and find a way to win. And I think that's both the perfect definition of Middlesbrough Football Club, but it's also the perfect, I guess, definition of the championship and what it's like and how hard it is to be consistent in this league and pick up results week in, week out, because these these crazy things can happen. But looking at the, the Huddersfield result, I think it... it to have picked up nothing from both Rotherham away and Huddersfield away would have been quite quite disappointing, I think, to say the least. So to just get away from the John Smiths with three points, regardless of how it come, I think it's a massive result with Coventry coming up. So as crazy as this football club is, and as much as we just don't make sense at times, I'm just delighted we got the win last night by hook or by crook. So... We're just weird. Yeah. Middlesbrough Football Club is a weird team. But it's a weird thing to love. Uh, Dana yes. Van Boromol, what, what, what's your one key <laughs> take out? <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, it's literally the same take out as Matt's, that football is such a funny game because, I mean, I didn't watch the Huddersfield one. I, d- I did a little bit in the car on the way back from Leicester, visiting family at Christmas. And by all accounts, we played decently well in that game, well enough to win. And then we lose because, of course, we concede a very Borough-esque goal. I mean, for God's sake, how many of these are we going to... Like, Matt, your little compilation is going to be into, like, the hours, isn't it, by the end of the season, I think, in terms of how long it lasts. <clears throat> but, yeah, and then we we play really poorly against Huddersfield to get the results. So it's just, yeah, football is, is funny. Yeah, and I would say... Probably to run it off, I was like, mine's probably, I can't wait for January to come, to be honest. Uh, I'm very interested to see who we bring in and permanence or a loans. But I think, if anything, the the game against Rotherham and against Huddersfield probably highlighted more and more the need for a, a proper centre forward uh, to finish our chances. You know, we'll speak probably about the front four and, and Corburn in just a moment. But I just think we need a bit of quality there. And I know the Rotherham game, it was just the... I would say probably a fluke that we, we lost or, or a very FIFA-esque type of game. Um our remote would have went straight into the TV if that was uh if that was me on, on FIFA. But um it was just yeah, I think it was I, I'm I'm desperate for a, a, a striker or someone who can just tie it together. But saying that I thought Rogers again playing well in, in, in creating opportunities and he is now our leading goal and goal contributor in, in twelve now. So it's fantastic for him. But I want to chat about Huddersfield because I'm going to completely ignore Rotherham and, you know, Corburn and Howison gave Borough the win. It was dramatic. It was fun. It was wet. It was just had everything apart from sending off. Um, but obviously Crooks and Dyke Crooks was injured and Dyke still went off, but are reportedly injured, but we don't know yet. Nothing's confirmed. But if it was, that's 11 players out with like suspension or not suspension, but like injuries off to the Asia Cup. And then AFCON is, is happening very, very soon as well. Um, but Matt, how would you assess Borough's win yesterday? It was a big, big win. Uh, Borough moving from 14th to 9th in that 
obviously from sixth to fifteenth is very very tight at the moment. Um, but you know, go tonight. How would you assess the performance yesterday? It wasn't great, was it? I mean, it was um, it was tough to watch at times. I think we we looked a little laboured, a little tired. We had plenty of possession, but didn't seem to do anything with it. It wasn't really clicking up front either, and it, it just looked like it was going to be one of them days. It looked like, for me, I was watching the same game happen as I did Rotherham, except we well, we did miss, actually, probably one chance that was equal to the four we missed against Rotherham. But it, it seemed very similar in terms of that we just didn't have our shooting boots on, and there was an inevitable sucker punch coming. So... I think the performance was was poor, but the result was absolutely huge. So regardless of how tough it was to watch at times, the three points is absolutely massive. And I think we weathered a decent spell by Huddersfield in the second half, scored, I think, at a very important time with Josh Corburn. And I think the, the house and goal could be a could be quite a big moment, actually. You know, I, I know there's been a lot of comparisons to the Grant Ledbetter at the moment, which of course I think led to us beating QPR back in in the promotion season, which obviously was a huge moment as well. And I'm not saying it's going to be as big as that, but I think just seeing the reaction of the team at the end, how much the win meant to them, of course, they're a very depleted squad. From what Carrick was saying after the game, you can't keep playing the same team over and over. So I'd imagine they are running on low at the moment. So to just get this result over the line against a very awkward opponent is massive for me. So I'm going to let the performance go and just be really, really happy that we've got three points. Uh, and, and you, Danny, you, you made the trip down to John Smith's as well. You were you were there in the flesh. You've seen Trotter's miss, uh, miss in the flesh. And oh. also you had you had the scenes uh, as well. So how was the, the trip for you? Yeah, it was really good. Didn't I say to you, it's Borough win and some scenes. And that is exactly what we got. It was really good. I haven't been to the John Smith Stadium since that lead bitter game where he scored that unbelievable free kick and then won the game towards the end with a penalty. So it's been about 10 years since I've been there. It is probably one of my favourite grounds in the championship just because of its individuality and character. Like it has a concourse with absolutely no roof on it. It is outside. And even that, when it's torrential rain as it was yesterday, it's not the best, but you know it's significantly better than some grounds in the... Uh, in in the Yorkshire region that are very much not individual and don't have character but yeah I, I enjoyed it it was you know the atmosphere was absolutely fantastic it was absolutely freezing I swear to god I've not been that cold at an away end since I went to Doncaster in I think this was like 2014 as well and we drew nil nil it was the worst game I think I've ever seen and it was freezing as well so it was like not the one but yeah, the, the Colburn goal, actually, the equaliser, if you look back at the highlights and listen to the reaction, it takes about five seconds for the Borough fans to start celebrating. And for me, half of it was like, well, I've just seen that Jones miss and it's like, surely we're not going to score. I know he's lofted the ball over the keeper, but some external force is going to stop that ball from going into the back of the net. Like alien Mr. Burns is going to spawn and all of a sudden save the day for Huddersfield or it's going to clip the post or it's going to go wide or their keeper's going to respawn right in the position to be able to save it. Like I, I thought this ain't going in, even though it's literally gone over the goalkeeper. And then part of me was like, it just looked weird from obviously where we were. And we needed like celebratory confirmation to then initiate celebrations ourselves. So that was a bit odd. It's the second away game that that's happened actually, because at Port Vale, when Johnny Housen loops that ball up, it looked like it was going over. So there was an, a delayed reaction there as well. So it kind of ruined the celebrations a little bit. Made up for it absolutely by Johnny Housen's goal that won the game. I mean, football can only deliver emotions like that where you win the penalty and I'm like yes get in and then my dad next to me is like well we haven't scored it yet and then we miss it and I'm literally I've got my fist in my mouth in frustration <laughs> like I'm surprised I didn't uppercut myself in the roof of my gob to be honest cursed in the sky the fact that we didn't score that and then to have that jubilation moment it's very odd that 10 seconds or so well it wasn't 10 seconds it was more than that wasn't it? it was about 40 seconds of just up down and up again it was yeah it was but unbelievable scenes and I, I jumped so much that I think I ascended and sat on top of the moon at one point it was just unbelievable 
Yeah, and obviously when Corbin pulls ahead, it was like a big, big moment for us. And then I think for for, for them to peg us back a little bit, it felt for me, I was like, oh, for goodness sake, here we go again. Uh, we've dominated, I would say, in certain areas. You know, we haven't held on to a lead. They've scored up from outside the box again. And it was quite poor defensively from us. And then the character to come back and, and win the game was was massive for us. But then before I, I come on to like the front four, I do need to ask, um, you went to the John Smiths, you had your hot dog, but did you have a pint of John Smiths? Oh, who do you think I am, Johnny? I am a gin drinker and that's pretty much it. But don't get me on the vodka because if you get me on the vodka, I will start start all sorts of chants like at Playbrew that one time before yeah. the uh, start of the season. <laughs> Well, I thought that was gin um, as well. I thought it was gin as well, but no. Hey. To be fair, it was. It was gin and it was a lot of it, but vodka absolutely accelerates me getting drunk, so do not give me vodka lemonade. But no, I did not have a John Smith's. Oh, Is there a joke in there somewhere that I'm missing? No, no, no. It's just, you know, you go to the John Smith Stadium, I feel like it's just kind of, you just you just go to John Smith's. So it's like yeah, the no. it's like when in yeah, Rome kind of thing, you know what I mean? So when, yeah, you, when you're no. there, you're there, isn't it? Um well, speaking of, of John Smith, the front four uh, for Borough, um, it was yesterday, you know, when we had Silvera up top, and that actually has no reference at all to go with it. Um, Silvera <laughs> up top, uh, Jones, Rogers, uh, and, and Sam Greenwood as well. Obviously, it changed again um, during the game, but we've seen more of this front four, and obviously Silvera goes away to the Age Cup now. Uh, but what was our thoughts on not playing with a recognised striker, Dana? Because... We originally seen it was very fluid, people getting behind, you know, we were seeing that rotation between the team and it was causing, I would say, West Brom a lot of problems. And we've seen it against Rotherham, we've shown similar signs, but Rotherham didn't really seem to work as well. Um, but now we've seen more of it, would you still like to see that type of forward line in the future? Well, when you asked me about it a couple of podcasts ago, I said, I like the idea of it, but I'm not necessarily set on that quartet of players. I think if you put Latte Lath in there, that it might be a little bit better only because he's just a general nuisance. And I think he's the type of striker to make it stick, at least in how he plays. He's not a stick man, as they call Josh Corbett, and he's not going to be the type of player to necessarily be a target man per se, should we label that? But he's the type that I think will just allow pressure to be alleviated a little bit because of his movement. I don't think we quite got that from Silvera. So I think it might work better with Latte Lath. But yeah, Silvera just, he, he didn't have the the nous really, which is understandable because he isn't a striker. So at points it will quite obviously fall flat, but... I like the fluidity. I like the interchanging positions, but I think it might work better with Latte Lath. Not so much Corburn, because let's be honest, you're not going to see Corburn play right wing at any point, are you? But with Latte yeah, Lath, no. I think he can. Well, yeah. I mean, Dale Fry put in a one hell of a cross against Sunland. So is he a winger? We could maybe play Dale yeah. Fry there. But the interchange position, I think, is an idea. I think is is good. It has potential, but I just I wasn't sure on that front four going forward so I'd like to see it with Latte Lath in there because I think he could pick up different positions on the pitch and I think he could probably do a better job with that his movement is, is very clever yeah Matt obviously Corbin came on he scored it gave Borough a different dimension so how do you feel when when you see Josh Corbin at top versus like the the front four that we've we've been seeing over the last couple of games um <clears throat> it's a tough one really I think like Dana said I like the fluidity and it can cause teams problems. For me, I'd still like to have that interchange fluidity in behind a striker. So whether it's the, the the three in behind that could cause that problem and we still have that sort of focal point up top. I think for me, it does say a lot that regardless of why Coburn come on that early, if it was a, a for an injury for Dyke Steele, it was a blessing in disguise because I don't know if Silvera would have made that run or whoever else was was up top at that point would have made the run that Josh did. And the finish was was pretty clever as well, just dinking it over the goalkeeper. I mean, I, again, I don't know if it's just because I've seen Silvera and Greenwood and the likes miss some absolute stinkers of late. I just <laughs> can't envisage them finishing that. I just I just see them swinging a foot at it and it hits the keeper or it hits the side netting or something. So I think it, 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 was, it was good to see Coburn in that position make that run 
it gives Rogers the opportunity to play that ball in, knowing that, that Coburn's going to be there and, and the finish was very, very good. So I don't I don't want to hang my hat on Josh Coburn being the man up front who's going to deliver the goals for us. And I probably wouldn't hang my hat on Lath doing that either. But like Dana said, he, he does cause chaos. So I'd still like that fluidity in behind a striker who is a little bit more prolific. And Coburn, and if he does stay, if we get a new striker, you might go out on loan, I don't know. But him and Lath can still come on like the like Coburn did yesterday and contribute. Lath could come on and cause chaos at the end of the game, stretch a defence late on. But for me, yeah, it's they're doing the job for now, but I would still like to see the fluidity in behind a more prolific striker, which hopefully we could we could get in January. I do think Silvera was to a degree bright in parts yesterday. And I don't know whether that's an unpopular opinion, but I thought on the wing, it was when he was on the wing and when he took on their fullbacks one on one. I actually thought during the game we don't have a one v one threat because every time Jones gets it, it goes back to Dykesdale. I think Jones is more for those combinations, those one-twos getting behind, whereas I think Silvera has the dribbling ability and, you know, what he was described as a live wire and the pace and I think the skill set to be able to run at a fullback, which is maybe what we missed yesterday. But he was the one that was at least trying to offer that, which is why I thought he was a bright spark. I mean the game kind of lent itself to players that were performing slightly better to be immediate bright spark sparks, but at this potential in Silvera, he's frustrating. Please. I don't want to see him shoot anymore. No more shots, Sammy, like, but get, get like one on, get one on one with your marker. And I think we'll probably see more from him. I was going to say on, on the shooting side of things, then I wanted Millsborough to shoot more in, in that first yeah. half. There's a couple of moments where just Dan Balas the, 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 the gap opened up for Dan Balas just, just to whip it. And um, mm. he just didn't. And he played it back. And I was like, oh, Dan, just fucking show, please. <laughs> um, I was like, I was like, just like, wanted to shake my television. Just going, ah. Um, <laughs> but. <laughs> Very frustrating, but I was going to say on the couple of points that you've both mentioned around like the players who, who played that system. I thought, um, I thought Corburn yesterday was bright, and I know I know you're saying there, uh, Matt, you can't hang your hat on him, and I don't think you can. But I, what I would say is, I don't think you can knock Corburn for coming in and getting a few goals to get us through to January, and I'm I'm quite happy with that. And you know, I think statistically, when you look at these like data points in in football, which is you know you combine them both, the the eye test and data, I, I don't think Corbin will ever come up good in those figures. I think sometimes, and yeah, I think that doesn't help him too much. But when you watch him, I still quite like him. I think he, I think he's just a bit of a nuisance, caused a bit of havoc. But is he someone that will get me twenty goals this year? This year, and we say this because no, no striker bar Rappong hit twenty goals since Bernie Slave, and so it's, I mean it's a very rarity in, in Borough's uh, aspect. But I think for me, like Corbin is, is done enough um, to be around for the rest of the season. Um, do I think we can hang our hat on him? Probably not. I don't think he's just as good as it. But I think he's been a, a good stopgap for what we've had right now. And go on and do uh, go on and, and develop even further. Come on and still be effective in games. I think he's he's very very good in in terms of causing a bit of problems for for a defense. Um, so good on the eye test, but I think uh, which sometimes doesn't help players. I think sometimes with that. But um, most players out there in the window, I tweeted yesterday about Tyrese Campbell. I'd like to see that. Um, if we were to be able to get him in, there's always that rumor about Bamford coming back, which I don't really go for on a loan deal, which I probably wouldn't do. No. Um, and you know, there's there's players that we could potentially bring in. But I think overall, I was quite happy with how we played yesterday in, t- in spells, in, in very brief spells. Well, I wasn't. Um, in very br- uh, said Dan, brief spells, <laughs> brief spells. Moment. Clutching. This could be, Clutching. yeah. I've got to be, I've got to be uh, happy with some elements. But we, what we did see yesterday was character change system during the game. And we've not really seen that much since he, since he's came in. We moved more. Well, talk about phases really where we say, oh, we're in a four, two, three, one, or they're in this. You'll tend to see maybe like a team move like through multiple phases in games anyway. And what I was seeing yesterday was that when we were defending, it was a five, four, one. Then when we had the ball, it was like when we were like on that transition, it was like a three, four, two, one. And then when we were in like possession, it was that it was back to that three, two, five. And it was just interesting to see how we were able to just to tweak things a little bit. Um, but why why do you think we did change it? Dana, because I would say we were fairly comfortable at mo- in moments, but with that 5 3 2 uh, low block that Huddersfield were playing, it did create a couple of problems for us, didn't it? 
Well, I think what causes problems the most was Sorba Thomas. Hmm. And you talk about players that we could target. I know you were talking about strikers there, Johnny, but I think Sorba Thomas is one of those that whenever he plays against us, he's a threat. And you're looking at, I think Boris should probably actually look at players that are performing for poor teams or performing for underperforming teams. So he's one that I think Boris should maybe look at, to be honest. He's got an unbelievable delivery and just always passes the eye test against us. Now, if he miraculously signs for us, he's probably going to be shit (laughs) because it's just the Borough way. But I think he was the biggest problem. We did come under significant pressure in that second half after they scored. And of course, it was the centre half that scores from outside the box. Why wouldn't it be? Obviously. And yeah, so I think their tails were up. They got a few corners. They got a lot of joy down their, uh, their flanks and down our fullbacks. So I think it was difficult up against Sorba Thomas in particular. So Borough needed to stem that tide and putting on Clark for Greenwood. I actually thought at the time, looking at it at surface level point, he's taken off an attacker for a defender. To be fair, Greenwood did nothing. And we need to have a conversation about that because he's about as ineffective as it gets in terms of his performances. And then he goes and scores. So like fair play on that, but I want to see more from Sam Greenwood in terms of his general displays. But then I got it because after that, I think it put the play back in Borough's favour a little bit, whereby, yeah, they were still probably getting down our our right side, but we had Clark there, Rav Vandenberg there and Dale Fry there that were doing enough to to kind of keep them at bay. So, And I thought Rav Vandenberg was fantastic, to be honest. So when it, when it comes to praise of play, spoiler, yeah, he's going to be in it. But yeah, I think it just... As I said, it stemmed the tide. I think it stopped them from building any further momentum because it did look like when they got that equaliser that they were the team that were going to go on and, and get that second goal. Uh, to add to that as well, I would say that system change was to dominate that central area as well. Um, when you've seen how Huddersfield were playing in that first half and how they were trying to to take advantage of Borough's space when we were getting the ball forward. I think what Borough were very, very good at the second half were when we did make that switch, it was nullified the bit where they were able to get in the transition because we had enough bodies. We had like six players pretty much in that little box area in the centre of the pitch. Play real, get bodies in behind. And you force them into wider areas. And I think that's probably the reason why they put Huddling on it towards the end just to see if they could maybe create a little bit of something. But when you've blocked that much area and you just create a certain bit of wide space, you're so far away from the goal, it's really difficult to create opportunities unless you've got a really good crosser of the ball in, and maybe in Sub Thomas as well. So I thought it worked quite well. Um, but it was interesting to see why we, we changed it. But I think it worked and you know, we went on and, and, and won the game. It also is quick when I mentioned Riley McGree played very, very well when he came on. It's such a shame that he's going to the edge cup. Why are you going, Riley? Why? Yeah, um, anyway, lovely, lovely footballer. So good to yeah. watch. He is, isn't he? And I'm gonna miss him. So mm. he could just fake like a, an injury, like oh, I could do with Danny Ayala. And just I've seen what I've I seen earlier, <laughs> earlier the week, but he got a red <laughs> card, came back. And then got another red card, and now he's got injured apparently. Uh, for what did you so, used to call him, Johnny? Uh, it's a, a liability, a ticking time bomb. No, a t- ticking uh, time bomb. That's ticking it. time bomb. Yeah. Time bomb. Never forgive him, honestly. Never forgive Danny Ayala um, for the playoff final. And just a nightmare, you know. Just didn't want to play between November and February, and you can't do that when you're a footballer. Anyway, but anyways, moving on, Dana. Johnny Housen, um, you know, someone who does like to play between November and February. Um, <laughs> Has now played over 300 games for Middlesbrough. Um, you know, courtesy of Sean Wilson giving us that stat. But it was his penalty miss, the goal. It was shades of lead bitter. But what I liked most about that was the celebration of it. Um, yeah. Is that what you want to see more of the team, where everyone comes together and celebrates as, as a group and shows that like that real togetherness and spark that we've got? Yeah, it's good to see moments like that. And to be honest, when the goal went in. I registered that it was Johnny House and then I saw his celebration and I was like, eh? Surely not. That's an imposter. That's not Johnny House. And it's, you know, like the, the SpongeBob episode where Mr. Burns has a tash, so it's a completely different... A SpongeBob um, episode where Mr... Where? Mr. Did Bur- I say SpongeBob? <laughs> Sorry, I meant Simpsons. Sorry. That's, say, you said, that's, you said that's another... Word. That's <laughs> another... <laughs> that's I was going to say, you said, you said Coburn tied the game earlier and then I would talk SpongeBob and Simpsons, like... You know, like what Simpsons was he one you said episode. before? 
Harry, Harry Potter and the Wizard of Oz. Harry Potter and the Wizard of Oz, yeah. I've only been on the cork. Not that type of Excuse cork. me. The drink. Bloody hell. Jesus that explains it. It's the hard stuff. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> no, God, you can tell it's the end of the year. Yeah, the, on that Simpsons episode where Mr. Burns gets a moustache, so it's a completely different identity, I thought... You know, usually Johnny Housen's the stick a knee out and then fist pump kind of guy, but then he full on celebrates this. So you can tell he absolutely loves it. But what I love the most about this is if you look back at the celebrations, you can just see Jonathan Woodgate. And I had to look back, I had to slow it down and watch it like 10 times. He's wearing an area hat, so you can't really see him initially. He is absolutely loving that. I don't know if Jonathan Woodgate loved that more than Johnny Housen did, but it was a really good moment, an unbelievable knee slide as well, by the way, it gives it some welly and I just really love to see that but yeah, Jonathan Woodgate went absolutely off it Yeah, and it could potentially be a knee slide club-esque knee slide yeah, but I'll leave that to the viewers and the, and the listeners, you know, I think if, if they want to go on our YouTube video and watch the knee slide, we'll even put it on our socials if need be but the bit, does, does he deserve to be able to put the results in uh, next week but someone who should have done a knee slide um and didn't because they missed from about a yard matt talk to me how's jones missed how has he missed from there i just don't get it <laughs> i i was trying to think of every possible logical reason as to why and the only logical reason i could come up with was he plays for middlesbrough football club <laughs> that was the only reason i was trying to think of something like like some physics behind it, like you know, some people online were saying, Well, he lost his balance, and others were saying it's wet. Which, well, apparently, if, if, it's, if it's wet, then suddenly players can't even make contact with the football. Um, but no, I, I honestly cannot think of an, ex of an excuse. I just feel like he just has to get anything on the ball as long as it's not his hand or his arm or wherever the hell the line is now that counts as handball, the sleeve or whatever. He just has to get anything on it. I don't care if it's his back. I don't care if he throws himself at the ball, if it rolls over him or hits his shin, his calf, his ass. I don't care. Just get <laughs> anything on the ball. Anything. And it's beyond the, the defender. And for him to just not even make contact with it, it's almost like it, it, it stopped and went in slow motion after that. Like the ball was just slowly heading towards the goal. I was going to get just in disbelief thinking, how is this happening? So, I mean, you know, I'm not going to jump on Jones too much because, you know, it will be dead. But it, had we not won that game, I mean, I don't know how, how he would have ever recovered from that. I do I do honestly believe he would have went to Rockcliffe the morning after and, and found the door locked or something. They won't let him in. Um, my only explanation is he plays for Middlesbrough Football Club and only a player from Middlesbrough Football Club could miss an open goal from two yards out. That's all he I was listening. Say. He was listening to you there, Matt, because he's absolutely booted your Wi Fi a bit. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's it. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. He's, uh, he's interacted yeah. with my Wi Fi and took me down. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, we got, I would say I got most of it. I would say I got most of it. I don't know what you're doing. I got 95% of it. Um, yeah, he plays for the football club. That's it. He, mm. he plays for his football club. That's why he missed. Only we would miss that chance from there. Yeah, and look, he did, he did everything right. You know, chip the keeper. It was in. It, and it, it spins a little bit, but it's like you, you got to you just finish it, please. Oh, just, just touch just it. it. I, yeah. Just I can't, I, yeah. kick it. Just kick get it. Anything on it. Oh. Anything on it. Any body part. Just, yeah. Get some up behind it's it. One, in. And look, it's it's easy to like you know you can go out and you can slay players, and I'm, we're not slating Jones here. It's just the case of how you know what I mean, <laughs> like how and look, it is what it is. Thank God we won. Yeah. Thank God we won. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. Thank God we won because I I would have been very upset. There would have been I would have been at uh, Greenwood's and Jones's house with a uh, pitch fox uh, probably this week uh, with the amount of misses that the that, that has. Uh, but it is what it is, you know. It's football. The score sometimes they don't other times, and it's twice now I've seen a Borough player miss from about a yard out at Huddersfield. Uh, Ashley Fletcher was one, and now I've I've seen Isaiah Jones uh, both at nil nil as well, and both at that goal. So maybe that goal is actually cursed. Um, but speaking of curses, uh, let's move on and out to the present place. <laughs> Oh! <laughs> 
Ah, yes, the praise and players. The only place I'd like to give praise uh, to a player, a coach or staff member, the Bora fans, uh, the person who got your secret Santa, Matt's hair and Dana's lovely jumper that she got from Teesside. Um, where you go, Dana, and giving you a little Teesside Tom a little push as well. Uh, Dana, as I said, uh, speaking of, of curses, no, the Malt curse, you, you <laughs> praise and players, next thing you know, <laughs> the curse for, for <laughs> Affinity. But who are you going to go for this week? Who was in your praise and place? Yeah, I'm going to put Rav Vandenberg in there for his performance. I think Rav Vandenberg, honestly, is signing of the season. I did previously think that Seni Dieng was, and I think there's still a case to be made for that. But <sighs> Rav Vandenberg is absolutely fantastic. He's outperforming Dale Fry at the moment, in my opinion, and he's just improving game on game. So fair play to the re- recruitment team for bringing him in because he seems like a an absolute diamond at centre half I think he was solid enough at right back but he's just he's so good at centre half like he's so commanding and mature in his performances and it's kind of that intangible feeling of you feel or at least I feel safe with Rav Vandenberg at centre half so I think he gets in there and then I want to praise Tom Glover because previously I've thought he's been a bit suspect there's been a few iffy moments in cup games. I remember against Bradford, he he went to claim a cross and then absolutely fucked it. He dropped a he dropped the ball. And I think they could have probably should have scored from it. I think we managed to block it. But I think Tom Glove is improving. He's making some good contributions. Obviously, he got rounded too easily for that um, Karoma chance, which we got let off with massively. Bangura coming in field and then not releasing the ball is always a bit of a red flag. Um, but, you know, he came up really big with a save in the first half from, I think it might have been Sober Thomas. And he's just making good saves that I think will build his confidence up. And obviously he's going to be our keeper now with Senny Dieng at AFCON. So I just want to give him some praise as well. And Morgan Rogers for that assist that we haven't mentioned yet, but the ball over the top was really good and he is a creative player that is creating. So it's good that we have somebody that we can say is creative, but is also actually creating and coming up in, uh, coming up clutching games. So yeah, three players there in my praise and place this week. Yeah, so I'd say Glover gets in mind. I think his distribution is excellent, by the way. Maybe something, you didn't mention that dinner, but while I was seeing more and more of, of him again uh, against Huddersfield and, and a little bit against Rotherham, that distribution was, was spot on. It's exactly where you want it to be. And I think it's really positive for that. I would say Rogers too. I think he was really, really good um, as well. I'd probably say those are, are my two really. I'd probably, maybe I'd probably put Housen in there for coming back as well and, and doing a bit of shit housery and, you know, and <laughs> shush, a little bit of shushing and a little bit of dancing and a little bit of, you know, knee slide and all the works. He didn't know what to do himself. Um, a gangster is what um, mm-hmm. Neil Madison called him. I don't, I don't think Neil Madison's seen many gangsters these days. Um, but Matt, <laughs> um, who, who are you going to go for? Who's in your present place? It's hard to disagree. Um, I think I think Glover definitely deserves to be in there. Um he also made a really good save in the second half. I think it might have been Karoma who's who cut inside and um, was going to put it in the far corner. I'm sure I recall. Yeah, that's the one. Yeah, he, he turned it round the post. I mean, that was a really good save. And also, I think for Glover, the fact that he has lost out on a position in the Australian national team in the Asian Cup, and yet two of his colleagues are going there. I can imagine for you know, for a player is quite disheartening to see that you've missed out on that opportunity. So I think for him to have the character to just crack on with his job at Middlesbrough, take his chance while he's got it and put in the performances he's doing, I think deserves real credit. And especially for me, who loves Senny Dieng to the moon and back, um, I'm more than happy with Tom Glover and to be our goalkeeper for the next month and a half or whatever it is. So he deserves praise, I think. Um, and I'm also going to give it to Johnny Housen because, again, I think missing that penalty, following it up with the goal, his celebration. I mean, I'm just loving this new this new reincarnation of Johnny House. And you know, he's he's been an absolute shit house to home crowds. He's doing Fortnite dances at the riverside. I mean, you know, it's like he's just got a new lease of life and I'm absolutely all for it. So I'll I'll probably stick the, the new version of Johnny House in there as well. Yeah, he's really rallied, doesn't he? He's really rallied. He's like that, you know, he's like that dog that's gonna die very soon, but it's not the point. Oh, um they all rally. They all have that they all have that that peak of you know, they rally again for maybe another year. 
and then it's a it's a slow ends, and I would say that's where Housen is in his playing career. Um, played until he's like forty six, and absolutely just ignores my comment and borrows keep being in one year contracts. Um, yeah, he's lifting the league cup. here forever. He's lifting the league yeah, cup is, in yeah. February. Hundred percent. It's one way to do it. It's one way to go out. You know, like just one way to retire. Just go and lift the league cup. Um, and just do that. Be great. Um, but let's move on. Let's move on to, to Coventry now, where uh, Boro is set to to face uh, the Sky Blues uh, and looking for the first time to to beat them because we haven't beat them in, in five game uh, five games now. So it's you know bit of coming a bit of a bulky team here. But um, we spoke to Mark from All Things Sky Blue to hear about Coventry this season. Hi, this is Mark from uh, All Things Sky Blue. Um, this is my uh, preview for the Middlesbrough game uh, on uh, New Year's Day on Bank Holiday Monday. Um, season so far um, started fairly slowly. Um, obviously, picked up our first win against Middlesbrough, but then we went on a didn't win our next game until the end of September against QPR. Uh, Formation-wise, he started the season with the same formation that um, got us to the playoff final last season, where he played uh, a three-four, one-two, or three, yeah, or three-five, three-five-two um, formation which didn't really work because although I just felt the personnel um, didn't really fit that well into the system um, and yeah we obviously we've had a lot of uh, signings um, a lot of players coming in coming out um, obviously notably uh, Vitsi Ocarez and, and Gus Hamer um, and it took a while for the players to settle in uh, whereas now he's changed it now to sort of a four you know, a 4-3-3 or a 4-5-1 formation, um, which has, has been very successful. We've only lost um, one game the last, say, seven or eight games now. Um, that was at Ipswich Town. We're obviously doing very well this season. Um, and that's, that's probably worked well because the sort of midfielders, Jemmy operates Sakamoto and, and Hachi Riot on the, on the flanks and they tend to trap back and play defensively as well so double up and help out um, Jake Bidwell and um, Van Ivac, um in the fullback position so it, it makes it harder for to teams to, to sort of um, you know create chances through the, through the wide positions um, in terms of the uh, January transfer window I think for me the most important signing for, for us is, is actually signing Callum O'Hare on a new contract because he's out of contract after the season. So that's that, if we can keep hold of him, that would be a major boost. Um, Middlesbrough, um, obviously, as you know, have had um, some good and bad results this season at home. And um, I think in terms of prediction, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be positive from, from an away point of view. I think we can go there and get a result. So I'm going to go for a 2-0 Coventry City win. Thank you very much. Bye. Uh, <laughs> Uh, Dana, explain ex- explain the eyewear. Explain. Well, the you know, in the in the words of Neil Madison, <laughs> put some dark and black glasses on him because he's a gangster. So I'm sporting some Johnny House and glasses. And uh, if you're on YouTube, I can't see a thing. So um, yeah, <laughs> I honestly can't see. I can't see anything. That's how well, bad my eyesight is. That's 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 good to know. Um, please put your glasses back on. I uh, just can't see. Um, <laughs> oh no, I'm finishing the podcast um, with these on. But anyway, Coventry. Um, you know they've been fairly quiet this season in terms of how they've started the, the start of the league. The underlying numbers are, are really really good for Coventry. Just things weren't really clicking. The last couple of weeks, I would say the last month. Uh, I would say that Coventry have played really, really well. I think this aligns with Callum O'Hare and also moving to a back four, which is starting back four to four five one. A uh, system moves to a four three three, and also when they are playing as well, they do try and play with that back three as well. So it's it's very, very similar. So the start positions are slightly different from what they've had previously. And I think the the now they've played with a high wingers, which kind of suits more Hadji right on that on that left hand side as well as Sakamoto on the right. And also it gives Gordon enough space in the middle. But Callum O'Hare is that player really ties things together for them. And I'm really intrigued to see if he if he starts. He had a long layoff. Um, he's came back. He's looking really, really good. We didn't play last night, um, of course. But I think he will uh, feature for them uh, on, on New Year's Day. I was going to say what day it was, but I still have no idea. Um, <laughs> Um, but that, guys, what, what do we think of, of Coventry then? Because then the box midfield that they did, it, you can still kind of see it in how the player is four four one one at times. 
Um, do you think they may shift back to that back three, which nullified Borough so well in the playoff games? And I appreciate the start of the season, Borough were getting the grips of the things. We should have really equalised with Silvera. We missed an absolute sitter on that day. It was never sure. a three 0 game. Um, but you know, it was the it was a result at the end. But what do you think they'll do, Coventry? Because since they've changed the system, had a new lease of life. Yeah, I think if you're Matt Robbins, you probably revert back to the formula that has obviously served them so well against us that's basically blocked us out. I think who holds the key to this game is probably Morgan Rogers because I think he's, there's more versatility in him than in Akpom last season. In Akpom, yeah, he could drop deep, he could take it forward, he could play Roman on those right side areas. But with Morgan Rogers, you can see him on the left, you can see him on the right, you will see him in central areas as well. So I think his fluidity and positioning and how he can pop up in different spaces could be quite important for us. So I think if Morgan Rogers plays well in this game, I'd be pretty confident that we can get something from it. But I mean, all respect to Coventry. I mean, actually, I'm going to I'm gonna say that Coventry are every bit a Premier League team and they are one of the best teams in the Championship. So I think that we will lose. And if you clock what I said about yeah. Rotherham in the yeah. last pod, you'll know exactly what I mean. Fair enough. Um, but they are a good side at uh, Coventry. I do think they'll get top six this year, which is interesting uh, to say. I think their numbers are really good. And I think there are a couple of players away. But they've, look, they've invested in, in a team. They use the Jokeres money uh, to, to really, really invest in that. Some of the signs, I would say, are questionable. But here we are. Uh, but Matt, what, what's your predictions going at the game? How would you feel about this one? I'm having to be really, really positive to see Borough getting a result. And even then... My, the logical side of me is thinking that this is going to be really, really difficult. I just, Matt Robbins is a manager who I just feel like he just, he knows the formula to to, to get the better of a Michael Carrick Borough side. And I, I'm hoping we might have learned from, you know, our recent meetings and, and we might be able to find a way through, but I'd be fearful of Coventry regardless, but they are in really good form. And I think they've got some really good players. I think Sakamoto is a really good player. O'Hare's obviously come back and has come into really good form. So I do worry. And I think looking at our recent head-to-heads, I think we've only won one of our last seven against Coventry. And I think we've only scored twice in that time. Um, one was the the winner in the game we did win, which was Spira. The other was obviously Archer's equaliser um, in, at the end of last season. So I'd, I'd just be happy to see a score against this Coventry side, never mind win. <laughs> But I do think, I I do think it's going to be really really tough, and we would have to put in a Leicester or maybe even West Brom level of performance, I think, to to beat them. So uh, I'm going to try and put a positive spin on it and say we'll draw. But I do find it very very difficult to see us winning, and we are going to have to play a lot better than what we did against Huddersfield if we've got any hopes of getting a result against this Coventry team at the minute. Yeah, and I would say, look, it's it's their game probably to lose. I would say, um, I think with with Borough's injuries that we've got, um, you know, the lack of a centre forwards, and well, say obviously if Corbin are played, but he's not fully fit, of course, you know, got Crooksy out. Um, there's a lot of injuries that we've we've got, and we're losing some really key players. So I think it's it's for them that we're near near enough a full you know full strength going into the game. We've got a couple of injuries. Kitchen being out is is one of the, is the big one for them, but. For me, I think they, they have to go in this game and attack, to be honest. And I think if, if they did, it opens space. And I, I'm very intrigued to see how they approach it. I think it'll be a different Coventry to what we played um, in the playoffs where they were a bit more defensive and try to really hold the box uh, midfield and dominate that. I think they might chop and change it ever so slightly um, against us this time around as probably, I would say, favourites to, to go and get a result here. But for me, I, I went on the uh, All Things Sky Blue podcast and said 2-0 Coventry. I might say the same. I don't know. Um, but it's look, it's Coventry's to lose, Borough's to gain. And I think we hopefully, fingers crossed, uh, get something from that. But guys, um, thank you very much uh, for joining me as always. The listeners and the viewers, thank you very much uh, for joining us as always. And I hope you've enjoyed our content in 2023, of course. We will be back uh, after the Coventry game to assess the whole of 2023 in its entirety. Um, but for right now, uh, this has been the last podcast of 2023, and this has been the Board Breakdown podcast, and that was all your Borough Master Chatter in a pod of the Board Breakdown.